better in heaven. Well, good morning, everyone. Are you loving the weather? Oh, baby. Man, all these people are starting to come out. And now you get to really meet your neighbors, right? You know, last two weeks have been awesome. Uh, we had our Bring Your Neighbor Day. We had 431 people there. That was amazing. And last week, uh, we had our campus weekend uh, with Joel and Courtney here. And it's so encouraging to see him grow up. Amazing seeing him change so radically. You know, last, uh, yesterday we had our parenting workshop. And I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it's amazing to see uh, our kids grow up. Uh, but we need to grow up with them, right? It's very encouraging to see a, a number of new speakers. Uh, Angel was there yesterday. She shared. That was awesome. Uh, we need a lot of help with the parenting. Uh, I do uh, want to share with you that next week we're going to have uh, a surprise. Yeah, we have three guest speakers. What's going on? Uh, well, Carl Buckner is going to be here. And um, Carl Buckner is an amazing story. Uh, he was in the hood in Chicago. Uh, and he's going to share all this stuff. You know, he was in prison and all that. And he, I guess he was a well-known rapper. Uh, uh, what, what, what was he called? Gambino or something like that? Anyways, um, uh, he got converted here. His brother's converted. And then uh, he, he uh, trained here for a while. But then he went uh, to L.A. Uh, with Chris Broom, who took a whole bunch of people with him. And uh, then now he's in New York. And he's on staff for the church, which is really amazing uh, to see how much he's uh, changed also. And uh, so he's going to be here. Uh, he's going to be preaching for us. All right. But now we had a problem. Uh, we, ha we found out that Michael and Sharon Kirshner will be here also. Now, who are they? Uh, he is the lead administrator for the church worldwide. Okay, so uh, he's going to be here. He, what they do is they go around church to church and uh, just find out what the needs are and so on and so forth. But he's got a great story too. He was vice president of General Mills and he quit that job to be an administrator for the church. And there's a little difference in pay there. So it's going to be interesting because uh, here you got Carl who's going to be here. He's this inner city guy. And then you got uh, Michael and Sharon, and they're about as white as white can be. <laughs> He's got white hair the whole bit. Uh, very in amazing to see. It'll be amazing to see next week uh, for them to come. Now, you might be thinking, where is everybody today? Where are they? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, this is a weekend that we have our shadowing for uh, Kids' Kingdom. So we got like 30 people back there learning how to do Kids Kingdom. We're going to do the, the switch. All right. Everybody's got to do the Kids Kingdom thing. If you haven't done it, it's a blast. Kids teach us a lot of stuff. Uh, one of the themes that we've been talking about this year is just maturing, raising up leaders, right? And uh, we sent out so many people that we got to raise people up. All right. Well, that, that takes time. It takes energy. And uh, what's really cool is that uh, you got somebody like a Joel who comes here. Now, Joel, last week he came, he preached, but a lot of people don't remember what he was like. He was yeah. transformed. And that's the title of the lesson t today is Transformed. Yeah. Now, if you'd known this kid before, you'd be amazed. He's like 19 years old, shaggy hair, just kind of goofy kid, right? Yeah. Who loved basketball. And he was trained here to do uh, a campus ministry. And he did awesome. Then he goes to L.A. Uh, and gets trained there. He leads a region there. And now he's leading the church in Syracuse. Comes here, and it's like he's an adult. And, and he's married. And he has a baby. And it's like, okay, who are you and what did you do with Joel? You know, that kind of thing. Now, the great thing is he comes here and he's feeling the same way. 
he's like, wow, this person has really changed. That person's really changed. I remember uh, we were in a circle at uh, 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 UIC for uh, uh, Devo Saturday morning. Henry was there and he's talking about his Bible talk. And he goes, you're leading a Bible talk? Wow. <laughs> Come on, now you got to know Henry, when he first came, you know, he couldn't even look at you. He was just, you know, now he, he's performing. He's being a Bible talk. Transformation. Amen. That's what it's all about. You know, you, you got to talk about transformation, right? You got the whole, uh, uh, you know, spring thing, right? Grass starting to come up. Snow is melting. Leaves are changing. Stuff like that. Uh, but transformation is a way of life. Right? Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, and we need to be transformed also. Come on, bro. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Come on, bro. Come on, Jay. Now, it's a way of life because we see it everywhere we go. It was a, a design that God has given us. Come on. You know, when Roger came here last week, too, uh, you, you know, he's up front. Did you notice he had a little tear in his eye there? He got a little choked up because that was his son. Who's preaching? And there's nothing more amazing than seeing your children grow up and do well. But the other thing that was amazing is that he couldn't believe how much we have changed also. And uh, he was sharing how Angie had come up to hug him, and he had no idea who she was. Because she's so different. But that's what happens, you know, you see kids grow up and mature, right? Uh, I remember my uh, daughter Candace, she grew five inches in one year. Whoa! And then she did it the next year too. All of her friends are like this tall. And uh, they, they uh, asked her to be on the basketball team, you know. There's another girl who's same thing, they called them the Twin Towers, you know. But she had grown. I remember, you know, I have a twin brother, right? And... Uh, uh, before I graduated high school, he was always shorter than me. So I could always kind of pummel him. It was awesome. But then after, uh, after he graduated, he shot up. Now he's like 6'3". I know! But now he's, we're too mature to, you know, fight. So it's, that's awesome. You know, but then there's the bad transformation. It's called getting old. It happens. You can fight it as long as you want, but you can't hide. It's going to happen. Things start to go out of whack and hurt and all that. You know, uh, it, it, this was so encouraging. I went to see my dad, and he's 84 years old, and he's in a nursing home. And I went to see him, and the first thing he said is, Boy, you're really looking old. <laughs> you know it's bad when your dad, who's 84, says you're looking old. Not bad. Thanks, Dad. Really encouraging. One of the other things, too, is, you know, uh, men tend to lose their hair. Yeah, they, they start balding. I'm starting to lose my hair. I'm, I'm starting to bald a little bit here, if you haven't noticed. But I have a conviction. Men don't really go bald. All right? What, what happens is your head sucks the hair in and shoves it out other places. It comes out your ears and your nose. It's terrible. Doesn't that make sense? Transformation. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting verse 4. <coughs> so such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? For if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. 
And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who had put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It, is, it has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and, the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What does that all mean? He's talking about two different covenants here. Now what's the whole thing with Moses? It says... Ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone. What, what, what's he talking about there? Ten Commandments. And uh, if, you, if you go to Exodus 34, you don't have to go there now, you'll find that when he came down from the mountain, he was radiant. And it says everybody was afraid of him. They ran from him. He's beaming. Like, he's going nuclear on us, that kind of thing. And they were kind of freaked out. He's like, what's wrong, guys? And they're like, man... And, and so we got to say, all right, well, what, what exactly was God trying to teach us and what does this mean? He says there's the old covenant and the new. Who follows the old covenant? Supposed to be the Jews. Well, that's what the Israelites followed. Now he says we have a new covenant. All right, that's Christianity. And he says that old covenant didn't bring about the joy that Christianity brings about. Does that make sense? He says there's two ministries. One was of the law. Look in Galatians chapter 3. On, I'm going to get a little deep here on you. Alright. Come on, Jay. Now, the old covenant was one of law. Do this, don't do that. It was a checklist. And uh, people hated it. Galatians chapter 3, starting verse 10. Come on, bro. It says, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. Oh, great. <laughs> For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. In other words, he's saying, you're cursed if you can't do it all. Well, nobody could do it all. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on the tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Okay, well what's he saying? He's saying you can't live by a law. That's not what we are called to do. Well then why did God do it? I'm glad you asked. Look in verse 19. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. Mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what is, was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, that faith has come, we are no longer under supervision of the law. What does that all mean? He's saying that God gave us the law to keep us in line until Jesus came. Because we're sinful people. You don't give us boundaries, we mess up. All right? And if you have teens, you know what I'm talking about. 
Not that we did that when we were teens, right? But we need boundaries. And man is so sinful, what did he have to do? He had to wipe out the planet in Noah's day. Because it's so sinful. He says, okay, I'm going to give you a law to keep you in line. Until Jesus comes. Well, why didn't he just bring Jesus then? Because they weren't ready. They were immature. And God's just saying, listen, i got to kind of give you this direction because right now you couldn't handle Jesus coming. All right? Let me explain it to you. Let's say you have a, 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 an infant or one or two-year-old that keeps sticking his fork in an outlet. All right? Not good. Now, if you sat down with them and tried to explain them what electricity is all about, they don't get it. What they get is... Don't do it. Don't do it. And so we, we put boundaries on things. But what happens is those kids grow up and they begin to start thinking. And they start to be beginning to think in a mature way and on a relationship level. And see, people didn't understand what love was. So God gave them prophets to show them along the way the heart of God. They still didn't get it. Jesus comes, they still didn't get it. They kill him too. Okay? But what happens is we needed boundaries to keep us in line, and that's the way we are. We need laws in our lives, but we also need relationship. And we need to believe. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Is that too deep? Too much? Okay. Let's get deeper. Oh, okay. All right, let's go back to verse 7. He says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? The ministry that condemns men is glorious. How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory that lasts? So he's saying, listen, that old law was fading, just like Moses was fading. The radiance was fading. And imagine if we did this. Imagine if you want to be a part of this church, we just give you like 10 pages of laws. All right, you got to do this, got to do that, this is the way it is, and it's a checklist. And then somebody calls you at night and says, uh, did you have your quiet time? Okay, did you, did you read your Bible and pray? Did you share your faith? Did you, okay, what, what exactly, how long did you read? What, what, you know, and it's, a, would that be fun? Is, is, do you feel close to that person? Do you feel tight? Do you feel... Now, the thing is, you know, John 1 says Jesus was full of grace and truth. You've got to have the truth, but you've got to have the relationship. And Jesus brought the two together. And he says, listen, that old law was fading. It condemned people because nobody could keep up. Nobody could do it. It's like be on the treadmill. Oh, this is fun. Jump on in. You know, we're going to love this thing. That's not what God wants. God wants us to love life. Yeah. All right? Well, what's, th what's this whole fading thing? Verse 12, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who had put a veil over his face to keep the, keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. What does that mean? Why did Moses put the veil on his face? Because it was fading away. There's nothing exciting about seeing something radiant and it dies out. It gets worse. Yeah. Nothing I can fire you up about that. Wow, this is amazing. And it just dies. But then, you know, Moses goes see God, and he'd be radiant again, and then it just died. So what Moses did said, I'm just going to put a veil on my face, because I don't want to let them see how this is fading. Later on, he says, verse 18, We who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with what? ever increasing glory so our joy and zeal needs to grow we need to be more fired up 10 years from now than we are now if our relationship with God is tight 
God expects us to be growing. Does that define you? You buy that new car. You don't want anything to touch it. I think that guy just sat on my car. He's leaning on my car. You know, you're polishing that thing. You know. What does that thing look like in 10 years? Bad news. It's not, hey, come and look at my car. Awesome. I'm like, yeah, that's really good. But in verse 14, he says something else. He says, their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses read, a veil covers their hearts, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That word turn means to repent. What does the Bible say that repentance does for us? It brings times of refreshment. When we change, that's exciting, and, and we quit the sin, and we break off things that are harming us. It brings refreshment. There's nothing fun about staying in sin. You know, hey, bro, it's an exciting day. I just really gave into a lot of sin. It was a great day today. No. But he says our minds were made dull. What happens is our hearts get hardened when we stay there, when we go through the motions, and we don't give our heart. We go through, you can see it in the eyes of people when they lose that fight and fire. Now they're just going through the motions. Their heart's not in it. And they inspire nobody. There's no radiance coming here. Will you come to my church? No. No, thank you. Is everybody like you? No. Well, why are you sharing your faith? Well, I have to. Somebody's going to ask me to do it. Wow. But what happens is we become dull. You got to hate that. But he says, it, whenever anyone turns to the Lord... It creates freedom. Does that define you? Are you free? Are you happy and loving life? Or are you controlled by something? You can't transform if you're going to stay there. <clears throat> we need to become more and more radiant. It's so exciting for me to see people raise up and grow up in the church. And I love the communion message because you hear about their transformation. You know, uh, Alyssa's going to be doing it today, and uh, you know, I heard it in the back there, and it's, I just told her afterwards, you have changed. Amen. I said, you've matured on every level. And that's, that's what you want to hear. That makes you more radiant. But that's how God wants us to be. The freedom is, is through the, the Spirit and through the, the Scriptures. If you read here again, verse 17... He says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. All right, so if the Spirit's with you, there should be freedom, right? And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. People should see Jesus in you. They, they should walk by, by, and there's something different about you. But that word reflect, if you look at it, has a little A there at the bottom of the page. It says, or contemplate. What does that mean? That's your quiet times. If you're studying your Bible and you're praying, you change. That's what happens. That's where you get the, 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 the power to change. Look in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. <laughs> Come on, Jay. So it's kind of amazing because really it's saying all you have to do is think about God and you will change. Imagine if that's all you did all day. Bro, you're really out there. What are you thinking about, God? Thinking about God. Chapter 12, verse 1. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Then you'll be able to test and prove of God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. He says, okay, you got your spiritual act of worship. Amen. All right, but that could be legalistic. 
But you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to change the way you think. Tendency is to think in a negative way. All right. So how does the world think? What do they think about? They're thinking about money, material things, all right, sex, you know, how you're looking, how you dress, that car. That's all worldly thinking. And they get consumed with that and concerned what other people think of them. As a disciple, you're not thinking about those things. You're thinking about God, and you're thinking about meeting the needs of the people who are hurting and lost. That's right. And you love people, yes. and it builds you up. Now, this is hard to do because we're surrounded by the world. You know, that's why they had monks way back when. They, they thought, okay, I'm not going to allow myself to get, uh, you know, all this, this influence to tear me down. I'm just going to go hide somewhere with a bunch of other monks. What is that? How are you going to win the world that way? And so it's a challenge. You go in, and everywhere you're at, it's, you know, billboards. They're there telling you the way you should be. You listen to the news. It's all world stuff. Movies, at school, at break, at work. All right, you're at, at work, they have break. What are they talking about? Talking about Jesus? No, I don't think so. They're talking about all this, oh, The Bachelor and all that stuff, you know? How about, how about if you say, hey, let's have a prayer before we eat? Who's this dude? Uh, let's have a Bible talk. Let's shake things up a little. What do you think? The world doesn't like that stuff. They want to dwell on the world. In 1 Timothy 4, if you could turn there. We need to be transformed by the way we think. Because the battle is in the mind. Chapter 4, verse 15. You know, a number of years ago, I got hired... Uh, at a jewelry store to be a goldsmith, all right? This is like in the early 80s. Anyways, uh, they hired me to be a goldsmith. Now, that's what I love to do because it was amazing to create something from nothing. Did the casting, the stone setting, all that stuff. So they hired me, and they kept me up front in sales. And I was like, I don't want to do sales. I want to work on jewelry. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you'll get there. And they just kept me up there. And I was like, hey, when am I going to go work in the goldsmith shop? And they said, you know what? People like you. People respond, you're happy. I said, I want to be a goldsmith. I don't want to do that. Do people say that about you? Now, I had to work hard to get transformed. Trust me, I was a mess. But I had to have a conviction that I need to change. I need to turn to the Lord. And there's no transformation without aggressively going after it. You know what bothers me is when you got a disciple who's been around for many years and they're the same. It bothers me because we have gold here. We have the answers to everything and we're not doing it. Come on. And the influence we could have doesn't happen because you're dull. You're giving in to sin, and you're allowing the things of the world to control you versus God. Look in 1 Timothy 4, verse 15. Now, he is writing to the evangelist. Paul is writing to Timothy, who led the church of 30,000 people. All right, now look what he says in verse 15. He says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Well, wait a minute. You're talking to Timothy. He's been around for a while. There was an expectation for Timothy to be changing. Amen. He says... Give yourself holy to them so that everyone may see your progress. There's an expectation that you always change. Hey, nobody in here is Jesus yet. When you get to be Jesus, you can stop, okay? But for me, that's got to be an expectation for me. I need to be changing. I can't call you to change if I'm not doing it. 
I need to become more spiritual. I just need to be more. I need to transform and radiate even more. That's got to be it. Otherwise, we stagnate. Question is, what's going on with you? Are you inspiring people to be different? Or are you pushing them away by your walk with God? He says, be diligent in this. Give yourself wholly to it. And he says, why? Because then you save yourself and your hearers. We affect people around us. And he's saying, listen, that's, that's the way it should be. Look in Galatians chapter 4. It is your presence that should make a difference. Do they see Jesus in you? Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. Now this is Paul writing to the, an area called Galatia. Chapter 4, verse 19. He says, my dear children... For whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Wow. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone. (laughs) Because I am perplexed about you. He's feeling like, you're not changing. I'm perplexed. What do I do? And he says, I'm in the pains of childbirth. That sounds pretty painful to me. You know, I used to tell Barb, it's so hard to watch you go through that. Feel your pain. Just doesn't cut it. You know? Pains of childbirth. Guys, can you relate with this? I don't think so. But what is he saying? He's saying, I'm suffering for you. I'm giving you my all to change you. I want to transform you. You know, I feel like that's what, you know, Roger and Joel and their relationship. What did Roger have to do to get Joel the way he was? You know, what does a parent have to do to transform their children? You know, hey, we're empty nesters now. We're done, right? No. No. You're going to be a parent till the day you die. That's just the way it is. And you know what? I have a lot more children now. That's just how I got to view it. Look in Colossians chapter 1. Oh, oh, so now you all want to come over and eat. You want to eat Barb's brownies? That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh Uh-oh. That's one way to make the guys radiant. I figured it out. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. It says, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works in me. <clears throat> Paul's saying, listen, I'm struggling here. He says, my goal is to present everyone perfect in Christ. And he says, I struggle with all his energy. Because it's beyond us to do this. Do you think you could have transformed people before you were a disciple the way we we are now? Absolutely not. It's amazing how we've been trained through the scriptures to change people. You know, I was uh, in a study with Omar this week. All right. Yeah. And um, he asked me, hey, what's it like to be an empty nester? You know, they just had twins, right? I said, you got a long way to go, buddy. Good luck with that. But I told him, I said, you know what, it's, it's, you know, you're still a parent no matter what. But you know, the great thing is how much Omar has changed. Joel used to be his roommate. And Joel goes, unbelievable. You know, and he fell away from the Lord for a while. But he came back and now you look at them. They're radiant. You know, they talk about when women are pregnant, they're radiant. (laughs) Emily was pregnant for quite a while there and (laughs) still is, still is. But here's the thing, you know, you have a hardship. Are you still radiant? Come on. I mean, she gave birth to twins and they were how, they were what, seven pounds each? Oh, baby. (laughs) 
That's crazy. Second Timothy two. Let's that's enough on that. Second Timothy two. <laughs> Verse one. Paul's, Paul's writing Timothy here again. He says, you, you then see my son, be, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ. No one serving in, as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share in the, of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Amen. You know, in the beginning here, Paul says, here's the process, Timothy. What you saw in me, imitate. All right? Then, he said, entrust that to reliable men who are qualified to do what? To teach others. This radiance, this walk with God needs to be transferred. The transformation happens. It continues down the line. You pass the baton on. But now, wait a minute. There's going to be some obstacles here, Timothy. Well, what are they, you ask? Point number one. It's easy to get you guys riled up. <laughs> Point number one, hardship. Just give in to hardship and you won't mature. He, goes, he says here, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You know, a soldier goes through hardships. You know, you got that basic training stuff. And we go, we go through basic training in the church here, don't we? We got that basic first principle stuff. All right, then we got to go on to maturity and continue the radiance. But if you don't want to grow, give in to, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to go through the hardship. Any of you going through hardships now? Is there anybody here at all? Well, why does God do that? James chapter 1. It's distracting, God. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Per perseverance must finish its work so that you may be, what, mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all, without finding fault. He says, hey, consider it pure joy. Why? Because God is maturing you. People don't want to suffer. You're going to have to suffer to grow. You're going to suffer anyways. You might as well do it to grow. Hardship is good. Look in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. Come on, Jay. Come on, Jay. It says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Wow! God says, listen, I love you, but I'm going to have to discipline you. Jump down to verse 12. Therefore strengthen... Oh wait, verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. What does all that mean? He says, no discipline is pleasant. It's not a lot of fun. But it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. All right? That, that kind of sounds like the radiance part. For those who've trained by it. You gotta train. You gotta go into it. If you don't want hardship, you're not gonna grow. Then he says, strengthen your weak uh, knees, feeble arms, and weak knees. And then he says, then you'll make le level paths for, for other people so you can heal them. That's the challenge. 
If, if, if you have an athlete, all right, all right, and he doesn't train, what happens? If he doesn't suffer through it, he doesn't do well. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Every year we have the men's retreat, yeah. right? The guys go up there to try to show off how strong they are. Yeah. You know, how many push-ups we can do and how far we can throw something. And, uh, you know, you got all the guys playing soccer. All right? And it's been a while. And, uh, you know, some of us put on a few pounds. So you got these flabby guys running into each other. You know, if you want to be good, you got to train. Right? Just what you got to do. Let's go back to 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Come on, lay it out, bro. Verse 3, he says, Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved with civilian affairs. Point number two, civilian affairs. What, do, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, you shouldn't get involved with um, save the whales, uh, politics, uh, mothers against drunk driving? What is he saying here? All right. Well, he's saying basically uh, that we are here to please our commanding officer. Who's our commanding officer? God. Those things are not wrong, but when we get consumed with those things, we get distracted. And we can, we can help out, but our purpose isn't saving the whales. All right? It's not. It's to seek and save the lost. That's why we're here. Now, we need to get involved with people, get to know people, but that's not why you're here to please your commanding officer. And what does that mean? Jesus above everything. Hey, your boss wants you to work on Sunday. Are you here to please your boss or Jesus? What are you going to do? And so... What happens is, if you want to slow down your progress or stop, you get caught up in other things. You know, I have a family member who's into politics. And all you have to do is say the word Obama, and it's a done deal for two hours. And I remember sitting down and saying, oh, who did that? Who brought that up? But that people are consumed with things. Now, you need to know about politics. That's not what I'm saying. It's are you consumed with the Lord? Or what have you given your heart to? Does that make sense? Yeah. We need to train and suffer to get there. That's, that's what the athlete does. But he also says here, verse 5, it says... He does not receive the victor's crown unless he completes according to the rules. What's the rule book, guys? Bible. Bible. Yeah. And he's saying if you're going to give yourself over to sin, you are not going to be radiant. You're not going to grow. You're not going to mature. All right, you're going to be dull. And what happens is we play with sin. Sin destroys our credibility. It destroys our confidence. And nobody's going to respond to you when they see it. We become hypocrites. He says, you gotta, you got to follow the rules. You stop transforming. You see some of these athletes that broke the rules. You had Lance Armstrong. How do people feel about that? Marion Jones. She had all these gold medals admitted to doping. They stripped her of it. How do you think she feels about those medals? You can't feel great about winning the medals when you cheated. Can't do that. And see, sometimes we try to cheat God. We try to take the shortcut. It takes hard work to do what's right. Did you guys uh, ever see the movie uh, McFarlane? Yeah. What a great movie. Yeah. You know, I heard Casey even teared up a little bit there. Allergies. Oh. Oh, okay. 
But you watch the movie and it's very inspiring because it's a true story and it's about a, a, a cross-country team of Latinos in California. And uh, they won all sorts of championships, but what the thing was, was these kids worked hard. They worked for hours before they went to school, went to school, went back to work. Yeah. Hard working. Is that part of your character? You know, the farmer works hard. They're up early. You know, my grandparents, farmers, I stayed there in the summer. They, they were up hours before me. You know, you're a kid, you want to sleep in, right? That's what you want to do. That's the right of a child, right? Is that what we do? Or are you mature? It was fun until Grandpa said, you're coming with me. Whoa! You know? But I learned to love the land because of him. You learn when you work hard. Does that make sense? 1 Corinthians 15. Point number five, be lazy. Four was break the rules. Three was uh, don't train. Two, don't get engaged with civilian affairs. See? Don't get caught up in civilian affairs. <laughs> okay, 1 Corinthians 15. Amen, bro. Trying to help you out. Amen. Point number five. Just be lazy. First Corinthians 15. Come on, bro. It says, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 58. <coughs> He says, stand firm. Don't let it bother you. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep fighting. Well, I share my faith all day. Nobody's open. I don't believe anybody in the city of Chicago is open. Oh, Can you, have you ever felt that way? Yes. You know, uh, maybe I have a disease or something. <laughs> well, wait a minute. You were open, weren't you? You know? And see, we forget. We, we want to quit. And he says, hey, you know that your, your work in the Lord is not in vain. Look in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Come on, bro. <laughs> he says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not, what? Give up. Sometimes we give up just before we reap that harvest. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Sometimes we don't like doing good to all people. We just want to quit. We don't want to suffer because we're lazy. You know, I appreciate Umberto here. You know, he reached out to Fonzie. Is Fonzie here? Is he around here somewhere? Downstairs in the Latin ministry. Uh, you know, Fonzie, he studied, poured his heart into Fonzie. Cranked it. Worked hard. Got so far in the study, Fonzie said, I don't want it. I'm done. But Umberto didn't give up. Continued to be his friend and prayed for him. Fasted for him. Even cried. Oh. But then God blessed it a, a few months later, three or four months. He said, okay, I'm ready. Let's do this thing. And Fonzie is transforming. Have you seen him? He's changing. All right, now what is Fonzie doing? He's transforming other people. It's amazing to watch the process. But let's say Umberto had just given up on him. Would he have made it? What if somebody gave up on you? Where would you be? Well, it's scary to think if somebody just gave up. You know, I'm writing up this lesson, uh, and uh, I was at uh, Lucky Dogs, and um, 
they had a TV up there and there was an advertisement for Dick's Sporting Goods. And it showed this little kid standing in front of a bunch of trophies. And he's dreaming. And it shows, you know, baseball players and all that kind of stuff. And it ends with the question saying, who will you be? Who will you be? And I thought, wow, that's, that's perfect for the lesson. You know? But why didn't they have a picture of Jesus up there? You know? That's the way the world thinks. You've got to want to be great, but you've got to do it the way the world wants you to be great. Versus, no, we need to be, become like Jesus. We need to be refreshed daily and walk with Jesus. The world promotes the world. We need to promote Jesus. God is trying to transform us. He doesn't quit. He struggles with all his energy. He gave his best that we would change, that we would repent and continue to do that. Will you allow to stop you? Is it going to be hardship? Are you going to be lazy, civilian affairs? Or are you going to be radiant because you're walking with God? I'm going to close with a challenge. I want you to grab a hold of the person discipling you. I want you to grab a hold of the person training you and say, I want to walk with you. I want to learn. I want to become more. And I want to fight for this. Actively, actively sacrifice and suffer to become more because you can change the world around you and transform it. Amen? Amen. Let's give Jay another round of applause, people.